seats. Uh, the first part of this meeting is actually an informational meeting, uh, a bond hearing warranted by the select board, and then we will go into the annual town meeting. Um, at that point, I'll remind you of the rules of order for the day. Um, this is an informational hearing. Our interim town manager, Frank Hield, is going to take over. Good morning again. Um, as probably everyone knows, when a municipality issues general obligation bonds, we're required to hold uh, at least one public information hearing. Uh, we did hold one at the last select board meeting and thought it prudent to do another one uh, this morning. We'll do this in two pieces. Uh, we have two bonds before you uh, as we go through the uh, day today and uh, actually voting on on Tuesday. Uh, the first one I'll present, which is the South Woodstock Wastewater Treatment Facility, and then uh, Chief Green uh, will take you through the, the uh, bond for the uh, EMS building. Again, as you may well know, the South Woodstock Wastewater Treatment Facility was constructed in 1967. Uh, it is 53-odd years old. Um, almost old enough to get Social Security. The state of Vermont, uh, in a progression of inspections over the last couple of years, uh, basically is requiring us to either renovate it or replace it. Over the past couple of months, uh, we have conducted an alternatives analysis, and uh, we, also have, we also had the opportunity to use the renovation work that we did at Taftville uh, as an example, uh, and renovation, uh, bringing it up to a standard that includes redundancy, uh, is more expensive than simply replacing it. The, uh, and just so that we're, we're clear on this, the state is just a little bit away from fines and or uh, substantial sanctions that could require us to uh, put a standby, actually a trailer mounted rig uh, in place, which would be terribly expensive. The bond amount is $2.8 million. At this point, we're, uh, we're hoping to be able to finance that with the state uh, clean water funds, uh, which would be uh, very attractive financially uh, those funds are a 20-year bond for a uh, 2% uh, admin fee. And if any of you have gone out and borrowed any money lately, 2% is a um, really good rate. The treatment facilities that uh, South Woodstock is basically what is called a package plant. And I don't mean to minimize it, but if you think of it as like your washing machine, uh, you buy one, you put it in place, and you use it. Uh, a package plan in wastewater treatment uh, is very similar to something like that in that we would build the new facility in place uh, while the existing facility operates, uh, and then the existing facility would be, would be demoed. The process that we're looking at would satisfy uh, not only the uh, phosphorus issues that are becoming more pronounced, uh, as well as the kind of nebulous uh, issues of nitrogen uh, that uh, go all the way to the Long Island Sound, the, the, uh, the, allow, uh, the allowable nitrogen in, in Long Island Sound. Uh, state requirement is that we get on it, um, and the timeline for this, uh, if you approve the bond uh, on Tuesday, probably would envision construction during the summer of uh, 21 into the fall of, of, fiscal, of uh, calendar year 21. That is the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, it occurs later in the town meeting. There's another discussion that will take place when we get to Article 14. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. If not, I'll turn it over to Chief Green to do the... I have a question. I'm sorry? Question. Uh, Jason Dravenko, a couple questions. Wait, just a technical question. Wait, uh, where's the mic? 
Thank you. Where, did, where does the debt service for that show up on the town budget as a line item? Uh, debt service really doesn't uh, really doesn't hit until fiscal twenty. It hits in fiscal twenty one, so there okay. is a hold on. A second. No, I, I'm sorry. The debt service won't actually hit until fiscal twenty two because we won't take the money until fiscal twenty one. Right. Great. Thank you. And the second question is, do we have a capital replacement or upgrade schedule for all our wastewater treatment facilities, understanding that we've made some improvements already to the Tassville facility, but do you foresee any other major capital improvements at our existing wastewater treatment facilities? I think in the fairly near future, you're going to have to address the main wastewater facility over uh, uh, on the east side of town. It to uh, there's thirty-five thousand dollars in the sewer budget for fiscal twenty to do some preliminary engineering to better understand what actually needs to be done to that facility. In the, is that likely to be a significant project? Um, I would be speculating, and I'm not a wastewater engineer. Okay, uh, but it, it's it's not going to be inexpensive. And so the follow-up to that is, do we have a capital replacement upgrade schedule for all our facilities? Uh, at this point, uh, we do not. But okay. I think there will be one developed over the, uh, the next year. Okay, thank you. Okay. Chief Green. Good morning. Uh, so I'm going to play my PowerPoint that I've presented several times just for information. It highlights the major needs of our building. Um, as soon as that is done, we'll continue on explaining it. The current emergency services building houses police, fire, EMS, and dispatch, as well as storage of equipment and vehicles. The current building was originally a gas station and a car dealership built in the 1940s. It was remodeled and the fire department in the 1970s moved from a downtown location to this building. Police and dispatch joined them in the late 80s and early 90s after another remodel was completed. A committee was formed to study a variety of options. First, are there other properties that could be used? The only properties available that suited our needs were selling for more than $1.3 million. Moving to another property was determined not to be a viable option. Second, the committee compared remodeling with an addition versus a completely new building. Cost was, again, the main deciding factor. The estimate for a new building is about $6 million, while an addition and a remodel is estimated at $4.5 million. Other complications were also noted for constructing a new building. Locating temporary quarters for public safety during construction, relocation of emergency dispatch services from the old building to temporary quarters and then back again. In addition to the building is necessary due to the structural design of the current building, which will not allow us to carry a second floor. During the winter, the current roof design requires us to periodically overheat the building to help melt snow and ice layers. 
Ice dams sometimes cause water to leak into the building. Each winter, a large expansion crack appears on the west end of the building, allowing heat to escape directly to the outside. The dispatch center requires strong air conditioning as expensive communications equipment produce high amounts of heat. Unfortunately, this zone also affects many other areas in the building, making them too cold during the winter and wasting energy. A Vermont Energy Efficiency Audit highlighted these and many other issues with the current building. We've outgrown our current storage needs, forcing us to use a metal container behind the building and overloading office spaces and storage closets. The police department evidence room is not up to standards and could be a liability in the future. Right now, the room serves several separate purposes. It houses secure computer servers, records, property, as well as evidence. There are several health code violations and concerns with the current building. One, firefighting gear is exposed to high levels of carcinogens at some emergency scenes. This equipment then releases these toxins slowly over time back into the air. Storing this equipment in areas open to employees and visitors can expose people to these toxins. Two, emergency vehicles run in the garage bays without an exhaust capture system, exposing firefighting gear and employees to toxic fumes. Three, there is no sprinkler or fire alarm system in this building. This would protect roughly $3 million in vehicle assets alone. Some of the electrical panels are extremely old and lack space for adding more circuits as the needs arise. Police are unable to properly secure subjects in custody. They can only secure one at a time and officers must remain in the room with the subjects. Currently, night duty EMS personnel that live outside of Woodstock are housed in a rented apartment that is a cost and a liability for the town. The EMS office is directly exposed to the public lobby, which is a safety and security issue. This concludes our presentation, which only highlights some of our major issues and needs that the proposed construction will abate. The remodel and addition will serve Woodstock Emergency Services for many years to come. Thank you, and we appreciate your support. All right, so again, that highlights our major needs. We have many needs, but during the informational meeting, I just want to touch on what's required. So this bond is not to exceed $4.5 million. Um, it'll be a 30-year bond, expires in 2051. The rate in fiscal year 22 will be $61 per $200,000. Um, so if anybody has any questions, we'll do what we can while we have time, and then we will pick it up again during Article 15. So I'm happy to take any questions. Eddie. Good morning. This on? Good morning. I didn't quite understand uh, the, the people that, something about um, outside the village, people being housed, or, and the 
presentation. I don't. Yep. So currently, we have 14 members on our EMS squad. Seven of those members live in other towns and come to work for us overnight. So we house them overnight in an apartment. So, of course, there's a lot of things I didn't quite understand about that presentation, but maybe we'll come clearer as the meeting goes along. And Eddie, if you want Monday, come down and see me at the fire station. I'd be happy to give you a personal tour. Any other questions? Right side. Thank you for that presentation. Um, there's a couple questions about the energy aspects of the design for the building. Yes. Michael, could you reference sustainable wood stuff? Um, we totally support the building as it's been planned, um, but we have these questions. The town has um, an energy plan that has goals to uh, meet 90% of wood stuff's remaining energy needs for with renewable sources by 2050 um, to promote insulation, heating, cooling, and other building systems that use renewable and carbon neutral energy in all town and village buildings. We also have a climate emergency resolution that's been passed by the select board and the trustees that has a goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. So my question is, has the planning for the building to date have any have the systems in place with a goal of net zero carbon emissions? So we looked into net zero, and right now there's only three certified fire stations in the United States, yeah. and the cost to make that net zero was extremely high. Well, we didn't, you know, not look at that. Um, we are planning for solar in the future. Um, unfortunately, geothermal systems are not, don't work on that site. Um, the insulation we've upgraded, the, the existing building will be upgraded. Um, as we move forward, we do what we can. We will be in compliance with 2015 energy laws. And I understand the net zero, but we're trying to be, you know, cognizant of the cost of right. taxpayers. Yeah. The, um, the way that net zero plays out at the current design standards, it tends to pay itself back in about seven years after the, the building is put into use. So a 30-year bond would be able to, to, to manage that. So we're recommending that me, citizens support the building as designed if it's modified to become a net zero retrofit. Um, and we appreciate that you've considered that and would be willing to work with you towards that design. I'm always interested in health, and if we have any uh, meetings with architects, I'm happy to be involved. So I that is the way we're making a building in that zero. Uh, thanks, David, for the presentation on, the, on your left. Yes. <laughs> I had a few questions about just the program of spaces. Sure. So, what's the uh, current square footage of the total, the current building? And what's the proposed addition? Uh, a little bit over 7,000. So 14,000 total, right? Um, the, in the, on the floor plan, it shows in the new space area in the back for additional trucks. Mm -hmm. Do those trucks currently exist? Yes. Where are they stored now? So most of them are stored at the station. We also showed that if station two was to be closed, that we could fit all of our equipment in that building. So the proposal doesn't include any new road. No, no, no. Okay. The second uh, question is upstairs on the floor plan. It shows eight bedrooms plus amenities to support those eight bedrooms, including two baths and showers and a 800 square foot living room and kitchen area with seating for nine. Uh, so can you explain that in relation to the night duty EMS? Why do we need eight bedrooms? Sure. So we plan this building for I hope no more than 100 years, but we wanted to be ready for that. So right now, there'll be two people on 9 EMS. The rest of the buildings will be used for storage or offices until they are needed as bedrooms. 
Also, should another event such as Irene happen or what have you, we can put extra staff in the building as needed. So it's, it's expansion potential. No. Correct. Okay. Um, okay. My uh, question about net zero, but also lead if it was designed to any design standards, and then. Um, no, I think that's it. My only reference point was the Barner DMS building, which was, you know, they expanded from 3,000 to 7,000. Um, that was 1.4, but that was a couple couple years ago. Um, and the question related to whether we needed the eight sleeping spaces now. Now, does that assume that those we'd have eight people sleeping there at one time? Uh, I could if there was an Irene we actually are going to put bunk beds in there so we can expand to 12, 12 should we need it for major snowstorms, uh, because police may need a place to stay, dispatchers. So we're trying to encompass the sleeping in it area in a broad use. Right. Not, not hiring new employees, you know, 10, 12, or whatever, uh, on, on a shift between two EMS people, and then as any event arises, we can offer a place for workers to say. And when would the anticipated construction begin on that uh, if approved? Yep, construction would begin as we're looking at spring of 21. Spring 21, okay. And is the uh, design, exterior design finalized at this point? It is not. It is not? It is not. There's okay. still some uh, paint scheme, color schemes, uh, what type of outside, you know, whether it's brick, wood. Right. Okay, thank you so much. Any more questions? Here. Good morning, Mark McElroy here from here in the village. Um, I have a question back to the net zero uh, topic. Uh, if I read it correctly, actually, Michael, this may be a question for you, but in the last Sustainable Woodstock newsletter, um, a statement, statement was made to the effect that all of the municipal facilities in Woodstock are running on 100% solar power. Uh, so I guess the first question is, is that true? And does that include the existing uh, emergency services uh, facility? And if so, why wouldn't the new facility also be running on 100% solar? Uh, I can't totally answer that. I don't believe we're running on 100% solar. We have a solar field that they bought into in White River Junction, which has significantly dropped the cost of all uh, town buildings, uh, town buildings uh, power bill. Uh, like I said, we did plan for solar on the roof as a standalone to the building. But again, uh, right now it's not planned to be added. Uh, so I don't know if that answers the question. I'm not really up on the solar building. I don't know if Jill's anywhere. Maybe she could answer it slightly better. Michael? <laughs> uh, Jill probably knows the specifics better than I do. Okay. So the what we bought into at White River Junction was solar power to replace our, en our electricity usage. As a town, we pay a very high rate for our electricity, more than we do it in our homes. Um, so that is replacing that usage right now. Um, over time, I can envisage that we will um, do away with some of our non-renewable sources of energy and increase our electricity usage. So certainly any building for the build we would look to be able to use rooftops for solar. So are the municipal facilities, including the emergency services building, currently running on solar at a level of 100% or not? I don't know the answer to that question, and that's why we've got a proposal later for a regional energy coordinator to do that kind of monitoring. OK. I, I guess the point is, if they are, and if we are, we're already at net zero. Uh, not for heat, yeah, for electricity, unless we're using electricity for heat. So, yeah, it depends. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we will pick this up again when Article 15 comes up later in the meeting, but uh, we are 
out of time, and we'll start the town meeting. So thank you. which was moved because the Volstead Act took effect on January 1st of that year. So it's the last time that was a warrant article until the 30s. Um, and I did notice that Article 9 in 1920 was a ballot question as to whether to sell the town farm. So we can see the, the welfare system evolving about 100 years ago. There were 164 students in the high school in 1920, 100 girls and 64 boys. Um, this was probably impacted by a few things. Um, young men leaving school to get jobs. A number of them had gone off to fight in World War I. Um, in the superintendent's report, he noted that Vermont was 37th out of the 48 states in teacher salary and was calling for increases in salary so that we wouldn't lose our teachers to other states. We had 12 elementary schools at that time. There were elementary schools in different neighborhoods. I noted, I'm pretty sure that the Walker School was not being used because the only expense for that year was $1.20 for insurance. I want to know who their agent was. The, Pel the Pelton School, which is now my brother's house, uh, they allocated $4.50 for repairs and $13.20 for insurance. Um, the grand list was only about $3 million back in 1920, and the town tax rate was $0.65, cents, the school tax rate was $0.65, cents, and the highway tax was $0.20. Cents. So it looks like we have reached our appointed time. Um, before I read out the warning, <coughs> Let me just um, remind everyone, it, it's great to see so many people here. Um, uh, just the, the rules of order for the day, we essentially follow Robert's rules. Um, I will read the article, put it on the floor. It needs to be moved and seconded before we can begin discussion. Um, my job is to make sure that each and every one of you who wishes to has the opportunity to speak, just not all at the same time. Um, we have microphones that we will um, bring up the aisle to you. When I call on you, please, please stand and state your name um, and make sure you wait for the microphone. I know some of you think that you can project. Um, some of us are losing our hearing, so it's better if you, you not, not you, Butch, I was talking about John and I. <laughs> but um, it, it is help, helpful if you would wait for the microphone. Um, I always like to remind people that we can disagree without being disagreeable. Um, we'll keep it civil. We'll direct your comments up here. Um, if you want to have a debate back and forth, that belongs out in the lobby or outside. Um, let's see. So before I read this out, Hudson, do you want to? Uh, would you all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the legal voters of the town of Woodstock, county of Windsor, state of Vermont, are hereby notified and warned to meet at the town hall theater in said town on the 29th day of February 2020 at 10 a.m. for the annual meeting and on Tuesday the third day of March 2020 between the hours of 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. to act on the following. The legal voters of the town of Woodstock are further notified that voter qualifications, registration, and absentee voting 
relative to said meeting shall be as provided in chapters 43, 51, and 55 of Title 17 Vermont statutes annotated. You must be registered to vote in the town of Woodstock in order to vote at town meeting. The legal voters of the town of Woodstock are further notified that informational hearings will be held on Tuesday, February 18th, 2020 at 6 p.m. and Saturday, February 29th, 2020 at 9.30 a.m. at the town hall in the town of Woodstock for the purpose of explaining the proposed improvements and the financing thereof the, of the South Woodstock Wastewater Treatment Facility and the Town Emergency Services Building. Um, reminds me, one other thing before I get into the, the articles. If there are no objections, this meeting is for the legal voters of the town of Woodstock, but we have a number of individuals here, our police chief, our interim town manager, who are not legal voters in the town of Woodstock. So if there are no objections, by unanimous consent, I will allow them to speak when they have pertinent information to help us. Seeing none, Eddie? No, no, as long as nobody objects, we can, we can do it by, by unanimous consent. It's much more efficient that way. Perfect. So, Article 1. Uh, before, actually, before I do that, too, uh, Butch Sutherland would like to address this meeting briefly. Uh, as you all know, by your town report, the uh, select board uh, dedicated this town report to Phil Swanson. And I would like to dedicate this meeting to Phil. Uh, the board agrees to that. Dedicate this meeting to Phil. And if you would all just take a moment of silence and remember Phil in your way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Butch. Article one, to see if the town will receive and act upon reports submitted by the town officers. What is your pleasure on article one? Moved by Eddie English, is there a second? Second by Byron Quinn. Any questions or comments on article one? No discussion, we will vote on article one. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it. Article one is adopted. Article two, to see if the town will vote to collect the town general, highway, school taxes, and state education taxes on real property and all other taxes levied through the treasurer under the provisions of Title 32, Vermont Statutes Annotated, Chapter 133, and fix the dates of payment as November 6, 2020, and May 7, 2021. What is your pleasure on article two? I know that. Moved by John Doton. Second, Jennifer Maxim. Any questions or comments on Article 2? Seeing none, we will vote on Article 2. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it. Article 2 is adopted. Article 3 to see if the town will vote to pay the town officers in accordance with Title 24 of Vermont Statutes Annotated Section 932 as follows. Select Board, $1,000 per year. Town Treasurer, $12,000 per year. Listers, $25.01 per hour. Constable, $25.01 per hour. Town Clerk, $31.52 per hour. Moderator, $50 each time served. What is your pleasure on Article 3? Moved by Eddie English. Is there a second? Second, Jennifer Max. I have a question. Yes. Uh, as the listers, as the moderator's wife, <laughs> wasn't that raised to $100 each time served last year? It was amended last year. It was the select board can warn it any way they want. Oh, okay. So you would be able to amend it again or leave it as is. That's your pleasure. Yes, Eddie. How did the, the select board uh, come up with this $21, uh, $25 and one penny? (laughs) 
Let me. It, it, it was based on a, a percentage increase over last year's rate, Ed, is what I'm hearing up here. That, and then you gave the town clerk a two, looked to me like a two cent. Uh, <laughs> come up with a two cent, two yeah, pennies. It, it was based on what they had last year and, and adding a cost of living increase. Ed. David Brown. I move to amend this to, re to give the moderator $100 for each time served. Is there a second? There a second. Uh, Jeff Collin? Uh, so there's actually an amendment on the floor. Any questions or comments about the amendment, which is to change the moderator's um, stipend to $100 each time served? Questions, comments? $100.01. Let's keep the confusion to a minute. Um, seeing no further comments, uh, we will vote on the amendment. Do you change the moderator's fee to $100 each time served? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Um, so the amendment is passed. Are there any other questions or comments on Article 3? Seeing none, we will now vote. Oh, there is. Sorry, Byron. Byron Quinn, I'm wondering what the town creditor responsibilities are today, seeing how they have bookkeepers in the main office. You guys want to handle that? The town treasurer um, has fiduciary responsibilities for the finances of the town, notwithstanding the fact that we have uh, accountants and, and uh, staff clerks in the administrative office, but when all is said and done, the town treasurer has a fiduciary responsibility uh, for what happens with the finances, and he needs to be compensated, he or she needs to be compensated for that responsibility. Any other questions, comments on Article 3? Seeing none, we will now vote on Article 3 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 3 is adopted. Article 4, to see if the town will vote to authorize the treasurer with the approval of the select board to borrow money, if necessary, in anticipation of taxes for fiscal year 2020-2021 to defray current expenses and debts of the town and sewer department. What is your pleasure on Article 4? Moved by Joby Thompson. Second, Jennifer Maxim. Questions or comments on Article 4? Seeing none, we will vote on Article 4. <coughs> All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 4 is adopted. Article 5. To see if the town will vote to appropriate the sum of $5,902,498, which includes the specified sums of money to operate each department and to raise by taxation the amount of $4,075,518, which is the necessary sum to defray operating costs for fiscal year 2020-2021. What is your pleasure on Article 5? Moved by Byron Quinn. Second, Eddie English. Um, at this point, I would, I believe the select board would like to comment on this article. Yes, Ed. I, uh, where can I uh, uh, discuss this? These articles are they going by line by line. Uh, the select board is going to um, present this right now, and, and we'll have a chance to, to question them after they've explained their their reasoning for presenting this budget in, in its current format. So that that's what we're. I was going to give them the floor first, and then we can ask questions once they've 
because they may, they may answer your question in their presentation. Eddie and everyone, we're going to change the format of our budget uh, presentation this year. Instead of going line by line, we have um, made a summary of some articles and some expenses that are different this year, and um, bear with us, ask questions as we go along. We're all going to present a part of it and a specific article. Um, I'm going to talk to you first about the budget. And the br budget as proposed, did you pick up these sheets when you came in that say 2021 on the front? Okay. I'm going to be going over this, the summary, which is right inside the front page. Um, our budget this year, our operating budget, is increased by 3.8% over last year. And this is primar primarily increases in salaries and benefits. Benefits, of course, are um, health insurance and those rates are presented to us and we have um, no control over those. Um, there are also an allocation here to capital reserve to cover the future payouts of compensated absences. There are also extra funds put aside for sidewalk and curb maintenance, bridge work, highway equipment, and capital reserve saving, and Ray and other board members will be talking to you about those specific things. The town budget that we are voting on in this article covers the cost of operating the town, the highway department, emergency services as it is now, police, fire, and ambulance are included there, the town hall, manager's office, and finance staff, the town clerk's office, planning and zoning, and the town's contributions to the rec center, the library, Pentangle, the little theater, and this uh, budget generally increases each year as salaries and other things rise and the cost of maintaining aging infrastructure also rises. Um, in addition, there are special articles that are presented which we will consider mostly by Australian ballot on Tuesday and some of those uh, special articles are also these organizations and local agencies that are included in the budget, but this is um, a manner in which Woodstock allows them to request additional funds. The proposed budget is $155,380 higher than the budget for the fiscal year 1920, which we're in now. The increase is due to increases in salaries and benefits, as I said earlier. There's an extra $73,000 for highway equipment for new and existing leases. We do lease a lot of our heavy equipment, which has um, proven to be a better way for us in many areas. A $50,000 reserve for retiring employees for compensated absences unused sick and vacation pay, an extra $50,000 for sidewalk and curb maintenance equipment, which will be explained to you by Ray shortly. And um, that information is on the next page of this handout that you have now. We have an extra $35,000 for bridge work. Our bridges are inspected biannually by the state of Vermont, and um, in some cases we have to do work immediately, and in other cases we can put it out over time, and we also save in capital reserve for some of the bridge repairs and reconstructions that we have to do. There's an extra $20,000 in salary and benefits for the Chief of Emergency Services, and an increase in capital reserve savings as well. Now, um, the emergency services chief, salary and benefits, we recoup, we recoup some of that from 
other towns and the chief of emergency services is also working now as our building safety inspector and additionally um, he is serving as our health officer. The estimated annual property tax impact of the 155 380 for Woodstock's home would be as follows. $35 for a house valued at $200,000, $70 per year for a house valued at $400,000, and so on. Now that is the increase that you will realize from the operating budget with the numbers that you see here on page 16. So um, I'll answer any questions to my part. And yes. Joe, I think has one. Joe, Dean Natale, did you have a question? Thank you. So those increases you um, mentioned, Mary, those are exclusive of the proposed bonds that we are also going to contemplate? That is correct, and I wanted to be sure that everyone understood that. And I would point out if everyone would stick to their assigned seating like Joe does, it'd be easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Cynthia Stevens, I'm wondering about Article 10. May I ask a question about Article 10 with the paving of the roads? Uh, no. We have to discuss the arguments on the floor at this time. Okay. Um, you could discuss a particular part of the budget, I suppose. Well, We're it, not specifically it, talking about Article 10, but it, it, there is some overlap there. So oh, we'll okay. Or my question has to do with the paved roads. Oh, Jill will be presenting that part of the budget. Okay. I'll wait then. Okay. Shall I? You. Perfect. Uh, yes. Paige? Paige Hiller. Um, what was your increase in premium costs for healthcare this year? Well, this, oh, go ahead. Or for your budget coming up? Frank is going to explain that to you. We uh, switched insurance. At health insurance uh, contracts are on a calendar year as opposed to a fiscal year. Uh, this calendar year, we switched from Blue Cross to MVP and um, saved a, an increase from Blue Cross of $55,000. So the, the benefit piece for the first half of fiscal 21 um, is flat to what we're spending today. Uh, we've increased it a little bit because we assume MVP will go up again uh, as all health insurance does uh, on the first of uh, the first of January of 2021. And what is your split with your employees? 80-20, The employees are paying a 7% contribution to premium. 7%? Yes. And what was your increase for your employees this year for this upcoming budget? Was it 2.5%, 2%, 1%? The, uh, the factor in the 2021 budget is 2.5, uh, generally to be allocated uh, uh, as the select board sees fit. And when you have premium increases in their, your health care, do you um, make the employee whole with the monies? Uh, if the premium increases, the 7% uh, would be on the increased premium. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, Jason, I'll get to you first. Uh, right down here. Um, and then Molly, if you can take the first over to Jason. Sound yeah. Wondering what the health officer does. The health officer responds to any calls we get if there is um, potentially a dangerous situation in uh, someone's home. They respond for, um, for instance, um, he, would, he responded this summer when 
there was paint being scraped from a building and there was question about if it was being done properly. And if you find um, a problem with standing water or issues of that nature, if there is a call that comes into town hall, the health officer gets the next call and responds and acts accordingly with the state regulations. Health officers are appointed for a two-year period. And the statutory office. About how often do they get called? I'm sorry? About how often <clears throat> do they get called um, per year? Well, in the summertime, they could probably, it would not be unlikely some summers, depending on rain situations and other situations of that nature. And, um, and it, for instance, in the past, I remember when there were calls about a lot of mosquitoes and things, that you get a call for the health officer at least once a week. And that is not always just a call and a response and it's finished. There's sometimes a lot of follow-up that goes along in correspondence with property owners. Yes, uh, Jason had a question. And Butch reminded me that there are regulations that he has to follow up, in particular with the short-term rentals. And as state requirements change, the health officer has to incorporate those responsibilities in his duty as well. Jason? Okay, so this is a, one's a comment and then a request. Uh, okay. the pre this is a comment and then a request to the select board going forward just in terms of the presentation. I'm trying to follow along with all these you know, various things and it's always a challenge. Yeah. And it's, I appreciate you uh, being patient with the audience and asking questions. Um, so it was very helpful, Mary, when you explained about the 3.8% 3, 3 increase. Um, and it's going to be really, really helpful to understand what the cumulative increase is on our taxes of all these articles, particularly when we consider the increase that's coming to us with this, on the school side. So I just attended a meeting yesterday, was it yesterday? Uh, of the school, well, school budget presentation, and there are about 10 people there. School taxes are 80% of our total tax bill. And I'm not sure I saw a select board member there, but that we're faced, we're looking at like about a 7% increase in our taxes there, at least in my taxes, uh, including the CLA adjustment plus the, the increase in the school budget. So what I'm trying to reconcile here as I listen to these is what the cumulative impact is of all these articles. Um, on page 20 of the, or 21 of the town budget summary, there's a good comparison of, that explains the operating budget, which Mary just laid out, 3.9 um, to four. And it shows an 18.85% increase um, sort of across the board if you include the budget plus the articles, et cetera, et cetera. So as we go forward in this presentation, it, it would be helpful to reconcile what you're presenting on this new handout with that because that 18.85% increase is like a 4.5% tax increase. So that plus my, my 7 from school gets me to 11.5% and that doesn't include any of the proposed um, bond proposals which won't hit until next year. Jason, thank you for your comment about the handout and the number of pages. This was, uh, that's helpful to us because this was a trial this year doing it this way. Thank you. Also, um, the budget meeting yesterday, I did not, I was not aware of that. And in the clerk, I worked in the clerk's office yesterday. We were handling absentee ballots. Um, the rest of the articles that are going to be discussed are going to follow a similar process and the percentages and the impact on tax rates per household um, will be presented by each individual as we continue to describe this. So um, bear with us. And um, of course, many of these articles will be voted on Tuesday by Australian ballot. And we won't have a clear 
total picture until then. But and thank I, you I, for, I, yes. I, I would point out too, ever since the state took over funding education, it's been impossible to answer the simple question on town meeting day, how much is this gonna make my taxes go up? Yeah, my point is just that right. it's, it's a cumulative impact. Correct. And voting on articles in isolation, that's a, a situation where we get our tax bill and we our jaws dropped. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now, can I add to that? So, Jason, in the packet that we gave you about the different articles, there's a table on the f uh, second page which shows the impact on property taxes for each article. So if you keep um, adding that together, depending on which articles are chosen, that's the, um, an overall look. So that you can see the impact of each individual thing rather than trying to do one big budget. Yeah, no, a, I'm, talking, a handout that I'm talking about this handout that you've got that looks like this on one side, and on the next side there's a table, and that's got the impact of each article per $100,000 of house value. Okay, yeah, we had a question right here, and then I'll come to you. Sir? Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Seth Webb. Uh, I have a question. I think it has two parts, but actually, it was a, a nice woman who asked a question behind me that I just wanted to do a follow up on uh, regarding cost of living and healthcare increases for employees. I think the question was um, with the increase in healthcare, um, and, and how does that compare net? How does an employee end up with their salary if you factor the cost of living increase together with the increase in healthcare expenses? Do they pay more next year or do they pay, or, or, or do they take home more? They will continue to pay 7%. Yes, ma'am. And the, if this budget passes, they will pay 7% per year, whether or not the um, premiums for the health insurance rise on January 1st, 2021. Um, the 2.5% 2 is considered based on information that, um, Jeff, can you help me? GPA, the CPA, the gross national, yeah, gross national product, and the percentage that comes therein. Um, there is a lot of discussion at the table about this when the two boards meet, and this is what they agreed this year to two point five percent, and. You know, yeah, of, yes, I understand. I understand of, there's a seven percent premium and there's a two point five percent cost of living increase. Correct. Now, it's, I was asking what the net impact on employees take home was, um, as you estimate based on healthcare costs. Well, some of that depends on whether you're full time. I don't know how much. The, you know, I, I, I guess I, I, when I think municipal employees, a lot of it uh, is their compensation is factored into both their wages and their healthcare. And that's traditionally been sort of tied together. But as they start to pay more in premium um, and take a, a portion of that, uh, that calculation becomes a bit more difficult to make. So I was trying to ask for clarification. I think that's what we were going for. Is that correct? I don't have that information right at hand at the moment, but we could get that to you. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, so that was her question. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I, I, this has to do with the budget, because I believe um, the budget funds a number of the parts of the budget end up in the fund balance that's detailed on the page 40 of the managers, the management's discussions and highlights. Uh, this is a $4.2 million sum near the bottom of the page in the fund balance icon. My first question about this is, do we have an accounting of this? I understand it's a mix of restricted funds and perhaps endowment and other trust funds. Capital reserve is in there too. The capital reserves is in yes. And Jill is going to explain to you. So um, there's a page later on in the book about the endowment fund and the balance of that. There's a page about public trust funds and that's included in this amount. I don't think we have a detail in here about what's in the capital reserve funds, but I think that's available in the auditor's report that's online. 
Okay, so there's an account, so the, the capital, because I, I, I wasn't able to find a list of what funds are actually restricted and what funds are funded through the budget that go unrestricted, which means there's, there's monies that pass through the budget that carry over year to year for larger, longer term priorities. And I was wondering, um, one, what are the balances in each of those funds? And then two, what is the spending plan connected to those funds? For example, in other towns, I've seen a restricted capital fund for roads, uh, bridges, culverts, um, uh, facilities, different facilities, and then a spending plan that's tied to what the board expects the life of that asset to be, um, and how much it would cost to repair or replace when that is needed. And so I was wondering if we have anything like that um, as we plan out this, this large chunk of spending for the town. Seth, the, the detail on the, uh, on the funds that you're questioning are in the, in the FI 19 audit. You can get a copy of that upstairs. Um, we included the, just the MD&A piece in the, in the, uh, the annual report uh, as opposed to printing uh, all of this in the report. But if you read the end of the, uh, or I think it's at the beginning of the MDA, uh, the financial statement is on our website uh, in, in complete detail. Um, the funds are identified, uh, however, the spending plan um, is a work in progress. Um, Got it. So do you know, and I'll be done with this question in a moment, do you know do we have separate restricted funds for those items, bridges and culverts, roads, facilities? And that are, because usually I believe by the month statutes, those are voted on at some town meeting and established, and then that allows the money to roll over into them, and that gives the insightful the authority to spend in the future. And I mean, so I, do we have a list of what those capital funds are and the documents that you represent? Yes. So we have, we have a capital budget. And then how can the, the public, is my last question, have input into that spending plan? All of our budget meetings are public. They're open to the public. And they're posted. And anyone is welcome to attend. Um, specifically, um, we know a few days in advance what department heads are going to come in. And we discuss those reserve accounts at that time with the individual department heads, and anyone is welcome to come. Yes, and within a couple of days of the meeting, you could know what department we were going to be discussing on any given budget meeting. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll look forward to, thank you for the um, And we usually, we usually yeah, start them in December. Yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm familiar, thank you. Okay, there's another question right here, and then we'll get um, hi, Dave Nixa. Um, I have sort of an observation and a question. Um, first of all, I heard that you have no control over employee benefits, and I'm not sure that's accurate um, based on the subsequent questions and conversations. Um, hopefully, because you've already chosen an alternative vendor for medical insurance, you, in fact, did have some control over that. Um, assuming that's also the case with any insurance that the town purchases. Um, my observation is when I look at the aggregate of everything that's in this budget and I look at the individual increases proposed for each and every article for both 2020 and 2021, um, my personal taxes go up 7.3% and 7.9% respectively without regard to the upcoming school board increase. So my question is, what are the priorities here? Because we have what I consider to be a significant number of projects and proposals. Those numbers I quoted also include fee increases for the sewers. So we have a lot of things coming down on us, especially those of us who have to make choices every month based on either independent um, sources of income or fixed incomes. And so 
when we make those choices, we know what our priorities are. We know what we can afford to do and what we can't afford to do. These don't seem to identify what the priorities might be. There are so many of them, some of which are a little difficult to understand, but I don't have a sense from reading this, or, and I've not only attended a few information sessions, as to whether or not some of these things can be deferred. Um, thank you for your comment first. And um, the special articles and the voting by Australian ballot on Tuesday contains most of those special articles, which have a big impact on where the, where the choices are made. And many of those articles are placed on the ballot that way so that you, the voters, can make the choices. Now, um, your first comment was about benefits. Um, we made a change in the medical benefit this year to save money. And while that happens, you can't change every six months or year to year. The people need a little security in the plan that they have. What I, what I meant is that we don't know what increase is going to be presented to us. What came our way last fall was quite extensive, and that's why the choice was made to make the move that we did. Does that help at all? Well, the priorities, we're hoping that by your vote on Tuesday, we see what your priorities are, and based on that, we may have to make some other choices and decisions. Yes, can we go Could I speak to that, uh, Mr. Honor? Uh, I'm not sure that I'm quite clear what you mean by the priorities. The budget that we present to you f that we're considering now is, is our priorities. What's on that budget for things, the projects that we want to do. We're petitioned every year by the special articles. We don't set priorities for that. If you get enough signatures, you can have your special article uh, put on the ballot. And we don't prioritize that. As Mary said, that's what the taxpayers prioritize. Rather, you want to think that the library is more important than the senior center or they're both important to you. So you make the choice on those priorities. Does that answer your question, sir? Thank you. Yes, and Bruno, any of the articles that say by petition Australia ballot that means that they were not warned by the select board. They were, people got signatures on a petition and that's why that request is there. Yes, Jason, if there's somebody else who hasn't. Oh, Seth, you had a follow? Oh, yeah, Kareem, you, you had a question. Yes, that's Kareem Board. Um, first, I want to thank the board for all the work that you do. Um, it's a lot of time investing this, so thank you. I just want to make a comment and then ask a question. Um, the gentleman that just spoke, and then Jason, it, it is indeed very challenging to, at least for me, to wrap my head around all of those expenses. And if, if you focus on the three big ones, which is the EMS, the bond for the sewer, which I understand has some regulatory implications as well, and then the bond for the EMS building, some back of the envelope calculations, theoretically, look, talking about the cumulative impact. Theoretically, if they were all impacting us going into next year, that would be equivalent not to a 3.8% increase of the budget, but close to a 22% increase of the budget, okay? So I just want to put that in context, especially as we potentially, unfortunately, may be, um, you know, facing a global economic slowdown in the next few months, maybe year, okay? Uh, now that I said that, um, I, I just have a very good question. Um, for those items in the budget that are one-off expenses, so for example, if we're putting one-time money aside to cover uh, somebody's benefits, uh, et cetera, or if we 
um, are budgeting one-time expense, say, for a consultant to come do a study. As we move into next year's budget, do we go back and actually remove that number, or is it just baked into the percentage increase and it just stays into that percentage year after year? Well, based on the duration of those consulting projects, for instance, um, if we need a consultant for a plan that's going to be done every five years, those consulting fees would be a percentage for the five-year period that we would save for it. Okay, so but once the project is ended, as we look at the budget again, we would remove that number from the upcoming year budget? Yes, okay, certainly that would happen. And um, Often when you compare year-to-year -year budgets, you'll see items drop off. One, you know, bonds okay. are paid off, etc., yeah. in, in one time. Extent. Occasionally in the budget, you'll see that for the, the year we're going to vote on, there's a zero. And if you look back, there was um, something that was completed a couple years ago. Great, thank you. But, and then, go thank ahead. Thank you, Mary. And if I could make a suggestion, given that there's a lot of items, that some of them, if you look at them in isolation, have their own merits and are very important. But as they start to become cumulative, they become scary. Yeah. Plus, there's the, the uh, school, the renovation of the school, etc. Um, if at some point the board may consider maybe putting in place a task force to look at ways to save money as well, I think that would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Ray, we'll get down to you, Sam. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a long-term Woodstock resident, actually was born here, and I'm over 80. And I had three terms on the select board, and uh, just a couple things uh, in this budget. I'm also still on the Capital Reserve Budget Committee. But in this budget, if you look at the articles that were petitioned to be specially worn, they're over $800,000. And all my time around here, I've seen very few of them ever turn down. And it's getting out of hand. And uh, I think we should all consider those special articles that are petitioned and on the warning to look at those pretty closely before you vote on them. Yes. Um, Sally, uh, or <clears throat> then we'll get to Joe. And reminder, we still have a lot of ground to cover. <clears throat> Could we request next year to put the uh, funds that are in reserve? It used to be in the booklet, mm -hmm. and so we knew how much was going mm -hmm. that we had set aside in the dump trucks and what have you. That was very helpful. Well, they are in the um, they are in some of the descriptive part of the budget. Each at each line department, line you'll line see line. that the reserves are in there and mentioned. It's not spread out. It used to be that it was over a five or seven year period. But what we have found is that sometimes what you think you're going to do in four or five years, you don't have to. But most cases, what you think you're going to do in four or five years, you have to do in two or three. And so the reserve funds change as the years go on. And I think that you'll, when the other uh, select board members are giving their part of the budget, if you look at the descriptive part, you'll probably see some of those reserves. Right. If you looked at page 28, so you'd see the capital reserves for the highway department broken out, you know, for um, different vehicles and how they they zero out as, as those vehicles are paid off. That that's that's a summary of capital expenditures. So they're they're in the budget. In, in each section, there's a part that covers capital expenditures. Um, Joe, you had a question. Uh, about those articles, um, those signatures, do they have to be generated fresh every year? Um, yes, they do. Um, but what has happened in the last few years, and uh, we see it in the office, is that organizations that work closely with one another are submitting their petitions on um, one uh, maxi petition. They're putting uh, two or three agencies 
on one petition and bringing us the total number of signatures that we would normally require for one petition. And they're all written at the top and they're submitted in mass. So those, those, that number of people that support that specific outcome may actually be supporting two or three. Yes, they are. And what you're doing when you sign the petition is you're asking the select board to put the article in the warning. You're not specifically supporting the organization that might be at the top. You're saying, yes, select board, we'd like to vote on this. Right. Um, Paige, and uh, Jason, and then Paige? Oh, yeah, Jason. Was so this is just because my first question uh, about page 21, I, I just want to circle back to that. Could we look at page 21 on this? Uh, where it's an FY20 versus 21 budget comparison in the difference. So that shows FY21 5.3. And um, I understand that the first line item is the town budget, which you presented. Proposed articles, organizations, those are the ones that we just talked about were petitioned, right? Um, proposed articles, town, which are detailed below, which include, to the gentleman's point, some one-time um, expenses and then some reoccurring. Right? And then uh, what's voted exemptions? Uh, voted exemptions are um, the public, quasi-public use buildings that are voted to be exempt from paying taxes. Like but the rec center, the rec center, yeah. center, so that we don't pay I think tax. The, they petition those every, some of them every five years. Right. And I think this year there's one, and um, there are two parts to it. One is that they're exempt from paying the taxes, and the other one is that the town will pay it, so pay the education part. So while we don't have to, we have to pay to the state, right. the educational portion of all those exemptions that are voted for buildings that are used by nonprofit organizations mostly, Right. So had the 5.3, which results in an 18.85% increase if everything were to pass, how does that reconcile with the 5.9 that we're going line by line on now? The $5.9 million budget, which is on uh, the previous page here that we're talking about, Article 5, 5.902. 5 So how does that relate, is my question, the 5.3 to the 5.9? 5 5.3, 5 oh well, um, for the exemption? And no, for the whole thing. There, there's a, there's a, there are different numbers. The FY21 budget in this summary table says 5.319502. Right well, we don't have as many uh, requests, some years, um, there are four or five. This year, I think there is only one. And that fluctuates depending on how many exemptions we're voting, voting in any given year. And Jason, can I add something? The 5.9 is the expenditures of the town budget that is in Article 5. The... 5.3. Okay. So, sorry, misunderstanding. We spend 5.9 in expenses. We have revenues. So the net of that comes out as uh, 4.075. But I'm not sure how that relates to 3.8. No, that's no, the fine. Question, I think Jason's question is if the, you're showing a chart that's shown budget increases on page 21, but huh? the number is 600,000 less than Article 5, which is. Yes, that's right. Now. And so what's, what's left out of the piece on page 21, I think, is the pertinent why, why is it apples and oranges, to John Spector's point? Yeah, because under, yes, under the chart that you're looking at, Jason, the 5.9 compares to the first line, 4075. We're spending, the first line, if you look at Article 5, is to spend 5.902 and to raise 4,075,000. That 4,075,000 reconciles with the town budget of 4,075. It's the net of revenues and expenses. So the bottom line isn't, or Article 5 is the first line in that summary chart. 
Got it. And the other is the incremental uh, proposed articles or voted ex exemptions. Right. So just a final comment from me, um, which relates to a couple of comments that were made over there. I think, you know, for me, looking at this, um, what's most concerning is that the town is now facing literally decades of accumulated need in terms of infrastructure investment. And as we've heard more than once, that the chickens have come home to roost. Uh, this building, the town hall, new middle school, high school, roads, parks, new EMS building, wastewater treatment facility, maybe even our water facilities, um, totals tens of millions of investment required. And as we're hearing, we're in a very fragile situation. We're talking about double digit tax increases, right? And so the thing that's concerning for me as a taxpayer is there doesn't seem to be a comprehensive infrastructure investment plan or strategy. I mean, I heard about there's not one for the wastewater treatment uh, things that puts forth a phase strategy that balances revenue with expenses. So in other words, we can't just ad hoc put these things forward that have pure expense only. We have to be looking at revenue upside as well with these, these investments because if we have all expense front loaded, we're in trouble. We have to be investing in things that also provide upside for this community, that bring people here, that spend money, that generate real revenue. So the thing that's concerning is not whether we do these or not. We, they all need to be done. It's a, me a question of timing, phasing, and we need a smart plan, a balanced plan for infrastructure investment. Um, I think as some of the articles are I think, it, in fact, that discussion has been happening for years on the Capital Budget Committee. There, there is very strong consideration of balancing and, and keeping these things level. You know, 10 years ago, we were building a new highway garage. They're, they're, they're just constantly... Right. We have tens of millions of dollars in investment. Where is the plan that lays out that we're going to do this this year because that's going to attract more people here. This one's going to make sure our roads are in good shape because we rely on tourism as our number one industry. Okay, we're going to wait two years for this one because this one's pure expense, but we need it. There's no... Right. No, I understand what you're saying. And I, I don't think that that's not happening. I think that it's just not being presented. As um, Seth Webb said earlier, there's a lot of regulatory uh, considerations that we have to make in planning some of the infrastructure improvements and reconstructions. And those conversations are going on. And um, we had a conversation about that yesterday. Yes, uh, I think uh, this question pertains to Jason's point, which was very well expressed, thank you, uh, and all the questions about the overall tax rate and the, the burden that it might uh, impose when everything is factored in together with the school. Um, and then also, um, it addresses the commission idea on saving money. Um, you mentioned that the capital spending plan, there's, there's $4 million that's sitting in the bank for us, that's listed on page 40. And since the spending plan, the majority of that spending plan, which relates to infrastructure, is not available in the town report, and we need to go and find it online, we don't know what your priorities are in terms of how that spending is going, and it, it makes it harder for us to um, support or oppose the budget, uh, because there's a big portion of it missing. Uh, so I, I would, my, my request is, is that I think we should include that detailed spend, spending plan and that it should go five years out at minimum um, uh, so that we can see that. And, and then number two, if we were able to see that, we might understand what the balances are in those various restricted funds, right? How much money do we have sitting in the highway fund? How much money do we have sitting in the Bridges and Culver's fund? How much money do we have in the facilities fund, or whatever funds we have? I don't know because they're not listed. And then, do we need, because of those balances, do we need to make these contributions that are in the budget right now at, this, at the level that is recommended? 
I don't, I don't know that right now at town meeting, I don't have that information to make that decision. And so I'm encouraging in, in future years that we make that part of the, of, of the, the handbook of, the, of this book. Um, and then, so that's my request. And, and number two is one clarification on the, on the comment from the moderator. Uh, I, I, and I just wanted to, you, you mentioned the capital reserve funds uh, on page 28 uh, in the budget. Uh, I was just pointing out that yes, capital reserve funds are do show in the budget. Yes, sir. And how they're being spent. But I want to clarify something around that. I think that's important. Is yeah, I'm good. These are the contributions to the capital reserve funds that we're making this year. This is not a reflection of how much we have. Correct. In those you, capital. You, no, you're correct. Funds. The capital budget. And and we do not have an accounting of, of what those are, and we do not have an estimate of what. What Jason mentioned, we don't have an estimate of what these future costs are going to be. So I just want to clarify but, that. And I think my point is that they are being considered by the Capital Budget Committee, and, and I agree with you that piece is missing from here. They would clarify this. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. So to respond to all of that, Seth, I think you've laid out our work for next year, which is to be much clearer on where the money is, where we intend to spend it over the next few, few years, and what the options are. And what you're getting today is not part of a grand plan, but a snapshot of how you can make some decisions today and on Tuesday. Uh, Roy had a question on you, Paige. I don't want to stand up this time, but I've been on the capital budget reserve committee for, I can't remember when I wrote in 15, 18 years. And uh, we had detailed discussions of your plan that you're talking about. And I, I see a couple of good candidates here for that capital. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking the same thing. Sign them up. Thank you. Um, no. Hey, hey, you too. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, go I, ahead, Matt. I just want to make one comment. Um, uh, the education tax is 80% of your whole tax that's within this town. One of the worst things that happened when we joined Act 46 is that the state demanded of us to present our, our budget in only one session. We could no longer do that within our individual towns. And we, we lost that ability to educate our taxpayers. Because as Jason said, when you do one presentation of those taxes, we have seen over the last three years only 10 to 30 people show up within seven individual towns. And so there is a loss of education for our taxpayers to understand what we are asking for that educational funding. Um, I think that each individual town's my recommendation to you is to petition our, our representatives to change that law to bring us back to presenting those things locally. Um, and the only way we can do it is by masses. I, I can't go there as just one single individual to make that change. And I think it's a significant change that needs to happen again because we'll have a better, better understanding of how your tax affects our tax as well and bring it combined. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Paige. And yeah. while you were talking, our representative Pamela walked in the room. He's already on you. Yeah. So he heard no that. Pressure, Charlie. No pressure. Charlie's in charge. Okay, I think that um, we're going to have to end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If we move on through more of the budget, and you get to ask yeah. your questions as yeah. we go. Yep, yeah. um, we'll take yours, and then it, it would be good, because some of this will come up in other things, but yes, your question. I can, I can wait. No, I can go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to echo what was just mentioned. And I, um, I think in order to make Woodstock sustainable and build it, before these things that are upon us going forward, we need to reevaluate how Woodstock um, contributes to the state education. And believe me, education in my family is a top priority. Um, I'm not saying we don't, it, it, we need to have a quality education for our students because that's a huge economic draw. People want to move to the stuff. 
And to, uh, so don't get me wrong on the, on the topic of education. However, I think that Woodstock can no longer afford to contribute at the rate of R to the state and, and at the expense of, of our own uh, well-being. We have far too many capital expenses coming from us to be able to uh, make this sustainable. And I would urge our state level um, elected officials to uh, perhaps comment on that. And what can be done to, uh, to unwind Woodstock from this terrible burden? Yes. 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 So, as Jeff said, but we, we feel like we're starting to stray off uh, the article that's on the floor. Which um, Ray has a contribution to the mm -hmm. article before we can vote on it. So, I'm going to turn this over now to. Um, Ray Bourgeois, who's going to speak to you about the sidewalks and curbs in Woodstock. Just one? Yes. Try it. I just want to mention that Ray and Jill and Ken, our highway supervisor, have spent hours and miles walking through the village looking at our sidewalks curves and what needs to happen okay um the as you all are probably aware you've walked through the town and the sidewalks especially the asphalt sidewalks in the village are in really bad shape um jill and i walk with ken we walk we have about five miles of sidewalks um, and most of them need repair so we have, we're putting in money for that. We also have the state coming in to redo the, repave the roads. And as anyone that's parked on Elm Street has noticed that the curbs are in desperate need of repair and straightening. So we're putting in um, $85,000 to get this work started. We're not gonna be able to obviously repair all the sidewalks at the same time, but we can start in areas, the worst areas, and, and get the curbs res reset before the state comes in and start getting the sidewalks put in better shape. Any questions? Yes, Kim. So my question comes back to priorities again. Can you tell us where you're gonna begin the work? Because as someone who lives down 106 and has kids trying to walk to the school, there is no sidewalk. And we're watching, walking, watching people come from the inn trying to walk down to the athletic center and stuff, and there's no sidewalk existing. And the vehicles are going extremely fast on that road, so I'm hoping that somewhere along there is one of the priorities. We looked at that, and you know, installing a new sidewalk, especially on a state road, will take time. Um, but that is something we looked at and that is, you know, we'd like to get that done, but we have to repair what we have first and, and move on. And we do have to get the state to buy off on putting a sidewalk on 106. Seth and then Joe. Just a question from the site board, you know, thinking about this discussion. If we have a series of, of coded infrastructure that we don't have a comprehensive plan to address. And we have a spending plan that is not detailed to address that infrastructure. And we have rising taxes that would be a result of this budget. Should we vote to support this budget? Or, or should we go back and create those things so that we could effectively make a decision about the budget? Um, I'd like to have your thoughts on that. You know, is that something, should we support this now, or do you want to go back and, and work on that comprehensive plan? Or, I mean, I heard Jill say that we've cut out our work for, for next year, but I haven't heard that from, from the whole board. Is that something that we're going to commit to, to create a, a long-term plan? Um, you know, I, I think that would be necessary at minimum to, to support this, this budget. Well, I think, as you know, Seth, we're, we're here to listen to the people and this is your your meeting, and if we don't take what you ask us, or at least under advice, uh, what you ask us to do, then we're not doing our job. 
And I think that, uh, you know, we hear you and we, we want your comments. And I, I would not favor that we don't support this budget for that problem. But for next year and the years after, we should uh, have a comprehensive plan for every project that we want to do. It's no denying that our infrastructure is bad. And we, the people, let that happen. You have a question, Joe, with your great assumption on the other side. Uh, it's been bounced around about when the state is going to redo uh, Route 4. Can you kind of give us an idea when that might happen? And um, who will be responsible for the curbing, the state or the town? Those are my two questions. Well, the state is scheduled to come in in 2022, I believe, on that, and the, they will not repair the curbs. That will be a town expense. And, and I will point out, as somebody who served on the select board for a period of time, these people meet year-round, and we've been discussing this year-round, and most of us look at it two weeks ago and, and start thinking about it before town meeting day. So, you know, there, sometimes the presentation doesn't represent the amount of work that's done into what, what they're trying to do here. And, uh, and not only is Route 4 going to be paid, but 106 and 12. So it's going to be probably a two or three month project if they get here. Other, uh, other questions? Oh, yes. Hey. Hi. Um, Alina Wilson. I have a question that pertains to, I guess, all of these priorities, and that is maintenance, um, both for our infrastructure and a plan for maintenance. Um, are, would the select board ever consider possibly having a person whose responsibility was to go around and look at the curves on an annual basis or the buildings. Um, I just feel like we are kind of, I think Jason said, the chickens have come home to roost in terms of deferred maintenance. And I'm just hoping moving forward, that's part of the plan. So is your question, is that part of the budget or part of our plan? Okay, we've had a lot of discussion about building maintenance person, somebody to do and keep an eye on uh, our buildings and report to the manager. And that is something we've considered very seriously. However, that means that we're gonna have to hire more people. And a lot of people are not necessarily in favor of bigger government. Yeah. Yeah. And I would point out, if the, I understand we're all busy and can't make it to select board meetings, but I think you can watch them from the comfort of your own home, if I'm not mistaken, Nisi. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> he doesn't know we're talking about him. Anybody got anything else they want to say about Macy? He's buying lunch, too. <laughs> yes, uh, just one comment and suggestion on the issue of uh, building maintenance and facilities maintenance and infrastructure maintenance, I'm a dedicated person. Um, I, I think the way that uh, it has been solved in other towns before it is by using some of the existing staff. And, and as you bring on, for example, the highway department could be uh, overseeing highways and facilities. Uh, and your hiring for that, uh, for those positions, could take that into account, uh, so that you could uh, be, use a, use your resources more efficiently. Now, I, I'm sure the Howie's crew is stretched here, and I don't know if that works everywhere, but that's one one thing I would encourage you to. Uh, In no disrespect, we're way ahead of you on that one. <laughs> but you said you, you don't have a, a, a person evaluating the infrastructure. So right now, nobody from the highway has been assigned to that, but we're ahead in that thinking. I got you. You're yes. thinking about that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, Karen Gilmore. Uh, my question is for Ray or whoever can answer it, actually. Um, it seems to me that three years ago, Phil said that the road Route 4 was going to be repaired by the state in 2019. That came and went, 
We're now in 2020. Last year it was 2020. Now we're 2022. What is going on and don't we have any influence with the state in getting the road repaired? Well, so, our representatives are here. Yeah. That's a good yeah. question. We'd like the answer to that as well. But let's put just one thing straight. Um, Ray said fiscal year 22, which so we're hoping that that's calendar year 21, summer of 21. And Allison's nodding her head. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Karen. I'm just curious about which month that's happening. And we've had some repairs in the past that have happened during Columbus Day weekend and some busy economic times. Is there some way we can control that happening? Maybe in April or March, April, May, if it's possible? It won't happen in January. Carolyn, when they were here last year, when we had our the preliminary meeting for this project, um, they are aware, because of other projects they have done, that we are very sensitive to their timing. And what we are hoping is that on the year this happens, they get in early in the spring, as soon as the plant opens so that they can come out with paving and it gets done in a three-week period before it gets busy here. We've asked for that. Now, last year, we were going to do something on Pleasant Street, and the day they were scheduled to come, it rained, so they couldn't come and do it, and they tried to reschedule it another day, and there was a reason it didn't happen. And within two weeks, it was too cold, and they were unable to bring the paving out and the plant had closed. So that's what happened last year when we were going to do some of Pleasant Street. And we are tied to the purse strings of the state of Vermont, and the scheduling sometimes is weather dependent. But they were here, and they know as early in April as possible. Or then we have to wait till the end of the season, and then we're faced with the possibility of cold weather. But yes, we told them early. John Specker. Um, I think we're kind of going back and forth between what I'll call sort of longer term strategic comments about the situation we're in, the, you know, the chickens coming home to roost, and then some more direct questions about specific lineups. I'd just like to talk briefly for a minute about the go back to the longer term issue because I think we're kind of at a turning point here. I, just, I think over the next few years we're going to need to think and behave a little bit differently, which I think we've started to do in this meeting in the budget that you proposed, and I support that. I went back, this is the, um, these are the minutes of your last two years worth of meetings, 176 pages, and um, I just wanted to see what, what was in there. So here's what, you know, well, so a couple things. First, we can, we can learn from this. It, so these folks met 50 times over the last two years, so they're working incredibly hard. Thank you for that. Really good. Yeah. <laughs> and the second thing, and what she said this, is that they're talking about what we tell them is important to us. So here's what's in that report. Roads are mentioned 126 times. Trucks are mentioned 98 times. Sewers are mentioned 91 times. Bridges are mentioned 54 times. You know what isn't mentioned? It's really interesting. Not once, not once do the words property values mentioned in the minutes. And we all care about that. I mean, almost all of us are homeowners. And I think what you're doing this year is putting forward, starting to put forward plans that protect our property values. It's painful because we haven't been doing that for quite some time. But the reason I'm going to support the budget this year and you know it's painful is, and I'm going to vote for many of the articles, is because I think the reason you're doing it is to protect our property values, and I think that's something that we all have stake in. So it's a longer-term comment, but I hope that we'll start to think, and I think we are, you are, and we are, hopefully starting to think about that. I just encourage people who care about your property values to speak up and tell us about that, because then they'll act out. They're just doing their best to represent us. Thank you, John. I 
another question right here. Um, Sam Natale, Woodstock, uh, obviously. Um, I almost <laughs> dread bringing this up, but spending a lot of money on the sidewalks, which really need it, um, only to have um, them now not well cared for by either a business or a property in the wintertime almost seems like why do we spend the money when there's some people who can't afford or um, don't want to spend money on proper snow removal for their sidewalks when they're covered in sidewalk in snow and ice the majority of the year here? Um, and whether or not the town has ever thought about making it a unilateral one contract for all the sidewalks, I'm sure you have. But if we're gonna spend this money on fixing the sidewalks, I, they should all be well taken care of, and a lot of people don't do that. There was a uh, proposal in the village uh, quite a few years ago, and uh, probably as many people showed up for that meeting as we have here today, which was quite unusual, for uh, the town and the village to take over the maintenance of all sidewalks and not be on the property owner's responsibility. And there were a lot of good comments, a lot of people favor, but the majority of the people voted not to have the taxpayers take over the sidewalks. Um, so if that's something that they want to reconsider another year or in some time in the future, I think the board would be more than happy to bring it before the voters. If we can keep moving through, we're still only on Article 5. Byron Quinn is back right there. Byron Quinn, can we move on to the budget itself and stop this discussion and it, discuss each article as it comes up? We, we are trying to, you get, trying to keep, I'm trying to keep us there, Byron. Yes. Byron's getting hungry. Yeah. <clears throat> Who's next? Who's next? That is the end of your presentation. Okay, unless. Okay, so. Good, thanks, Mary. Yes, Jack. Molly, can you just take the microphone from that? Yes, um, so that is the, what the select board had to present on our file. Um, I got it. Uh, Jack Anderson. Uh, I have a question regarding Article 14. I don't see it on your sheet where the tax impact on property, uh, that particular article, uh, there's no number for that. Um, I think it would be appropriate to discuss it under Article 14. We have Article 5 on the floor right now. Um, yes. Just real quick before you move from the um, discussion about sidewalks, I am a village trustee and I have been privy to some of the conversations and I understand there's a big push for the sidewalks because of the paving happening in 2021 now. Um, so I'm just curious who exactly is in charge of um, how those two projects coincide and how the state is talking to the town and how that's all happening. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, I kind of want some more detail and understanding around that. The, curb, the, the curbing has to be done before the state comes in. The sidewalk repairing or replacing the sidewalks has, has no bearing and no relationship with paving the, um, pave, paving the streets. So it's two separate, the town will take care of the sidewalks with a, with a different vendor than the state has for their paving for the roads. Totally two different. The curbs have to be done by the, by the town before they pave. Okay. Any other questions or comments about Article 5? Did you have a rich? Yeah, uh, Rich Kozlowski, um, just a quick question. I think it was probably a year ago, there was a presentation on, I think it was beautification, and there, were, there was a presentation on bump outs, and 
when, when the work is done for whether it's curbing sidewalks or road, are any of those being built in? What, it, what are we going to have when we're done with sidewalks, curbs, and road? Will it, what, what is it that we're actually going to get when the, the entire project is finished? I think um, all we're going to get from the state is smooth roads for a change. For a while. For a while, okay. Um, I don't believe there's any new bump outs uh, proposed. We haven't seen the final uh, plan from the state. So until we see that, uh, I'm assuming that what we have is what, we, what we're going to keep. And this has set by AOT regulations anyway. When what can and can't happen with regards to the, the, the rights, the visibility right away on the roads? When the state does a project, they have to follow all their federal guidelines for site and ADA and all those things. And that's how we got what we got last time when they did the ship, the cut and pave. There will be some, I, I suspect there'll be some hearings uh, when they get closer to it, some public hearings. So pay attention to that. That's gonna be a good time for uh, public input to the state about the whole project. They, they required to have public hearings. I, I think John Doton might have something to say before we vote on this. John, you want to make your highway presentation now? Anything to say about your highway presentation? No. Oh, is it ready yet? Yeah. OK. <laughs> I don't know if I need this loudspeaker, but I'll try it. Uh, customary for me to always tell a story of yesteryear, uh, and the one I'd like to tell this year is uh, about an old fellow, Jimmy Aiken. He lived over on the Cloudland Road, uh, <coughs> right to the foot of the hill where Kent's live now, and. Jimmy was a big old Irishman, a heck of a good guy. I remember him pretty well. And this was probably 80 years ago or so. And Jimmy was telling one time about he had a cow dog. And the, and the cow dog's name was Haig. And he used to send Haig up every night or every afternoon when it got milking time to get the cows. And they were always in a little basin up the top of the hill on the pasture, and he would go up and round the cows out and bring them down. Real faithful servant. One day he sent Haig up after the cows, and Haig come back in a few minutes, and he happened to be watching Haig, and he had no cows ahead of him. So he said he reprimanded Haig severely, and he said send him right back up over the hill after the cows. In the meantime, he looked out behind the house and the tails had already come down on a little knoll there behind the house. Jimmy said it made him feel like a damn fool. He didn't even know as much as his dog did. Uh, an interesting thing has happened in this job and one of the interesting things that happened this year, we. We're interviewing a new person for the town. And I was there pretty early uh, before the meeting started. And this fella come in and I figured he was the one we were going to interview and that was for the interim town manager. And I said, are you Mr. Hell? He said, no. He said, I'm Frank. And since then, we've had a very good relationship, and I want everybody to give a round of applause to Frank. He's done one heck of a job. Okay, now to get back to the highway development, if I uh, have any questions coming through, I either Ray or the town manager can answer them. Uh, 
you follow along the highway budget here, and uh, it's just about the same as it was last year, but there's a few increases. The total increase is $135,000. But <clears> there's <throat> $20,000 for highway construction and maintenance, and a lot of that is, uh, one of the items is sand and salt which is really hard to predict. We used a lot of it this year. The storms have been as such that uh, we have to use as much for a small storm as you do for a large one. And that item is bouncing around and usually costs us more money every year because the price of the sand goes up and the price of salt goes up. Okay. And there's $26,000 for our bridges and culverts and storm drains and Gulf Avenue storm drain is one that's got to be fixed. Then the next item would be a, in the total would be a $73,000, 780 uh, item for highway equipment. We've got a new loader coming this year and we have new truck coming this year, a larger truck. Not, not physically much larger, but it's a larger undercarriage than we've had. We've had trouble with the front ends on the other ones. And this truck has a heavier front end. Hope it's going to give us a lot better service. Uh, increase in the highway repair. For equipment, it's uh, $10,000, uh, considering the amount of, of vehicles we have, that's not a, really a very big item. Uh, adjusted lease payments on the greater, 12000 and the projected lease for a 10-year loader <coughs> replacement, 35000 That loader is a... Uh, old order for the village, right? And the load, it's getting old, very old, and it's been dependable so far, but uh, it's getting so you can't get parts for it, and it needs to be replaced. Okay, now, uh, dump truck lease, $12,000. That's for a little dump truck. We have one ton. Uh, well, that's for uh, George's truck, which is the large truck, which I was just mentioning. Uh, one ton truck is one is uh, six thousand uh, dollars. Leaf blower attachment. This is a new attachment that uh, they've recommended to blow leaves out of the ditch to keep culverts from plugging up. And uh, we can use it on the uh, tractor that's down to the sewer plant. So there won't be any question about the power. It'll be a unit that can just put onto the your tractor and use it. Okay, capital reserve, a net increase, 5,000. And several uh, items were reduced, like. Uh, the, uh, then we have a new item, is a, is a uh, repair for the roof, for the lower garage, for the old garage. Uh, the roof is getting pretty bad on that, it's starting to leak, and the building is sound, and we still use the building for storage, and uh, a lot of times the loader is put in there overnight for storage because it's right handy to sand pile. So we've got to keep the building in good shape. Okay, uh, dump truck replacement. That's uh, that's a uh, normal thing. Three two. Uh, that truck is getting ready to trade, and we've been trading trucks quite often, but uh, with the amount of uh, uh, use the trucks have, 
uh, it seems like a good idea. Uh, the repairs to a truck, if it's a major repair, is a major expense. Also, uh, the grader and loader and the backhoe are in that category. Uh, some people think that we trade them too often, but uh, I can tell you if, uh, for instance, if a transmission goes out in a grader, you're going to spend half the price of the grader to get it replaced. And this way we keep them under the lease, but we also keep them under the warranty. So that's the reason we trade quite often. So uh, I guess that's about all I have on the highway department. If there's any questions, uh, I guess uh, the deep questions we can refer to the town manager. Any questions? Yes, right here, and then we'll get over. Uh, David McGuire, uh, my question is the benefits approach 50% of salaries and wages. Can you speak to that issue? I'm not sure I understand. Talking about for the highway department? Yeah. You have something to say, Ray? Quite honestly, I don't have a detailed explanation. Uh, we take these numbers uh, uh, from payroll and from direct cost. Um, I'll get you the answer, but um, you can probably do it later this afternoon, but the, th those numbers are taken directly from our, from our accounting system. The, the, I, I, I really don't know what the composition of the, uh, the highway department is, but family insurance is more expensive than singles and couples, and it, it all breaks down uh, just standard employee benefits. But I'll get you the detail. The employees might say it's because their salary is too low. It <laughs> <laughs> could be. Yes. Yes, I'm wondering if we have given any consideration to alternatives to using all the salt that we use. Um, the salinity of our rivers and streams has increased dramatically, which is obviously affecting uh, aquatic life and also part of our uh, attraction to this area. Um, I know that um, when I was in Colorado, it was banned, and they used magnesium chloride as an alternative. I don't know what the cost benefit is of that, but it seems like the volume of salt that's used on our roads and sidewalks is significant. And um, just curious as to whether or not we're looking at alternatives to that from an environmental perspective. I'm not sure that um, environmentalists allow the use of chloride. I I've asked that question myself. Um, but that's a good question. Um, the amount of salt that they use, um, I can tell you that if we don't salt, the phones ring because we are in a pattern of making sure that our roads are safe and well-traveled for school buses and everybody has to come and go to work. But. Uh, we do use an awful lot of salt. And uh, I guess from where I sit, I've noticed it myself. But uh, I don't want to be the one that says we don't salt and then somebody gets hurt. So thank you. Uh, just as a follow up to that, I uh, worked for the town for 30 years in various capacity. And we did trials on magnesium chloride liquid. We did it on beet juice and a few others. The most cost effective, best for your vehicle, pet friendly, <coughs> green uh, salt we use now. So just so you know, they have done research over many years and worked 
using what we feel is the most cost effective. Yes, Byron? I think payment is to reduce by $20,000, but we have a special article for $150,000 for payment. So I'll talk more about paving when we get to that article. But yes, that is, that is what has happened. In order to get this budget to a 3.8% increase, paving except for the 26000 has been taken out and made a special article so that people choose themselves. I, th I think for some people who might be new, what, was it in the 80s? There was a, a, an article passed which limits the amount that the, the budget can be increased year to year. Yeah. Uh, um, and so that's why the select board is working to, to stay within that constraint. And so I guess the way that they can get around that, if you want to say, or put the choice to the people specifically, <laughs> is to warn items as a special article if it's going to cause the budget as a whole to go over that threshold that they're limited by. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah. Sort of, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, just by way of explanation, I'm not endorsing your... Yes, Roy. One quick thing about salt. Uh, I'm a meteorologist by trade of a lot of hydrological experience. And any impurities in your snow, salt, stuff like that, it runs out first before the snow melts. You may see the brown snow in your snow melt for around. But what's going on there? All those impurities with the salt flow fast out of the snow and into the river. Any other questions or comments on Article 5 here? Okay, the select board is, that's all they have to present. Are there any other questions or comments about Article 5 before we vote on it? Yes, David. Wait in the front here, Hudson. July, David Schwarzman. July 4th seems to be mentioned about uh, three, at least three times in there. Uh, in one summary, it says we're spending 10000 on it. In another line item, it says we're spending $7,500 of budgeting. And then I couldn't find it really fast, but there's another spot that seems that we're spending twenty to $30,000 on it. I think that's um, Fourth of July. Um, we do uh, collect money for Fourth of July from um, taxes, and that's the 7500 that you see. Um, the Fourth of July presentation every year of fireworks in the evening um, cost the town, cost, not the town, cost a total of about $12,000. We've been fortunate last year and the year coming that we've um, obtained a grant from the Economic Development Commission to help us with those expenses. We go out to uh, community businesses and very generously they give us um, contributions every year. What we don't spend on one year would go into the next that we have never been fortunate enough to have any money left at the end of it. That's why we had to get um, the grant from the EDC last year. Um, I saw that too, David. We are not collecting $17,500 for fireworks. I think things appear twice in there that I saw that the other night when I looked at it and forgot to mention it in the office this week. But I believe the $7,500, which we have accumulated or collected through appropriation of taxes in past years, may be um, what we will do this year. And any money that we collect from our generous donors, which are the businesses right here in Woodstock, is where we go for those donations are off are brought in to offset 
the amount that we have to take. Last year, um, we requested um, $5,000 from the EDC, but we only ended up needing 1600 So we have bands that come. We have um, events that happen there. And the 4th of July committee has to help with um, a tent for the band. The other concessions that you see out there are for the nonprofit organizations that run them, and any proceeds from them go to them as well. Did I confuse you more? Well, that's what, it's about 12000 a year for us to do that event. And the cost of the fireworks has increased slightly in the last couple of years. Yes, Joe, and then Byron. <clears throat> so Molly, uh, just to Joe DiNatale. Thank you. Um, we're spending a lot of time talking about money and how to come up with it and how to budget it. I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but whenever the appropriate time does arise, I'd like to hear an explanation from our representative to Montpelier. As soon as we finish voting on this article. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. I move the article. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Okay. So this is a motion to um, close conversation and vote on the article. Uh, it's not debatable. We need to vote on it. It requires a two-thirds majority. So all in favor of um, ending discussion and voting on the article, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Okay, so the question has been moved, so we cannot discuss it any further. Article 5, to see if the town will vote to appropriate the sum of $5,902,498, which includes the specified sums of money to operate each department and to raise by taxation the amount of $4,075,518, which is the necessary sum to defray operating costs for fiscal year 2020-2021. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 5 is adopted as one. Um, thank you thank all for you. your patience. Um, Thank you. At this point, um, we're going to break for lunch here shortly, but first I'd like to take the opportunity um, to open the floor, offer the floor to our incoming town manager, uh, Bill Kerbin Jr. is, is here. And I just thought I'd it. give him a chance to introduce himself and then you can maybe have a chance to talk to him at lunchtime. Hudson, you want to take the microphone? You want to come up here, Bill? Thank you. Um, I just want to introduce myself real quickly here because I'm between you and lunch, so that might not be a good way to get started here. <laughs> but I just want to say I'm coming from uh, a little town in Virginia. I've got about 25 years of uh, local government management experience, or excuse me, local government experience under my belt. I've been um, the Nancock, Virginia town manager for the last three and a half years. That's about an hour north of Virginia Beach and the Hampton Roads area. And I just want to say I look forward to working with you all. I do have an open door policy, so please come and see me when I start. I'm going to start on March 23rd in a couple of weeks, so I'm looking forward to it. Meanwhile, I'm going to enjoy the lovely town of Woodstock for the next couple of days, and I'm going to head back to Virginia for a couple more weeks. So uh, thank you very much, and I'll look forward to meeting all of you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll get to you, Charlie, and, and Allison, right after Butch had something else he wanted to just... Butch always had something to say, doesn't he? So, uh, you know, uh, Frank and Phil were very good friends. And Frank said to me one day, when he knew Phil was sick, he said, if you ever need any help, just let me know. I'll be glad to get up. So, uh, I called Frank right away, told him the bad news, and then I said, 
can you help us out? And Jeff, are you there? Can you come up? So Jeff and I met with, with Frank uh, and we had lunch with him and uh, a couple of the meetings after that introduced him to the board and he did come here and he's, he was hoping to be here a month or six weeks and he's still here. But, uh, he's done a great job for us and uh, he's, uh, he answered our request very, uh, and he, he always told me that he, he didn't do it for me, he did it for Phil. And, uh, but anyway, we have a little gift for you, Frank. He thinks he can play golf. So uh, come on up here. So between the, the town and the village of Woodstock, we have a gift here. It's for round of golf and dinner for two uh, at the Woodstock Country Club, uh, Woodstock Inn. And uh, maybe Bill knows how to play golf too, or thinks he does. So, uh, but anyway, uh, we're very appreciative of, uh, and I know Jeff echoes what I say for the village trustees. We're very appreciative of the, the guidance and leadership that you've shown us the last few months. It has been a distinct honor to uh, have had the opportunity to work with you all over the last six months. Um, this is a fascinating community. Um, the involvement that you have, um, the challenges that you have uh, are exciting. I, I told Bill Kerbin if I was 20 years younger, I would have been a serious applicant for this job. I think there's lots of fun for somebody yet to, be, to, to have, and uh, I'm so impressed with the way you all work together to to make things happen. We have a lot of different views, but uh, when all is said and done, this is one fabulous little community. Thank you. state representative brought up so many times during town meeting and just deferring questions so this should be very exciting for us uh, so my name is Charlie Kimball I represent Woodstock Reading and Plymouth in the state legislature and this is Allison Clarkson one of the three senators who represents Windsor County in that in the Senate um, and I just want to uh, preface my remarks I want to talk to you about what's going on in the legislature this year uh, but also then starting out about taxes because I think that's what, there's a lot of interest in taxes. Vermont is one of the most progressive tax structures in the country, meaning that individuals with a lower income pay a lower percentage of their tax, of their income in taxes. Then do the higher earners in the, the state who pay a higher percentage of their taxes. So Vermont does have a very progressive tax structure. That doesn't mean it's perfect. And for that reason, a tax, Structure Commission was formed two years ago. And they have been working through all of the different elements of taxes, whether it's income taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, rooms and meals taxes, all the ones that you pay. And to re make a recommendation to the legislature in January of 2021. It is not easy to go through this. There was a Blue Ribbon Tax Commission not that long ago, uh, nine years ago, I believe, is when they made the recommendations. So this is a comprehensive review of where we are recognizing 
that there are communities that are unfairly burdened by taxes, there are some that are not. And so I can't tell you that there are solutions immediately at hand, but there is work being done. So, we, and I'm happy to talk to folks about that later. Um, but I just want to then give you a, some kind of feedback on what's going on in the legislature this year. Does that sound all right? Sounds okay. great. All right. So, uh, first I just wanted to say that the, the Vermont treasurer is holding $88 million hostage. I'm kidding because that money is actually unclaimed property that has been a forfeited bank account, an uncashed payroll check, contents of a safe deposit box that the treasurer is sent to by law in the state of Vermont. So there's $88 million sitting there waiting to be distributed to, this, uh, to the residents of Vermont. And I have a few names out here. No, you're not on there, Butch. Uh, so, <laughs> Matt, I didn't check you, Matt, but, uh, but some, some of the folks are here. Uh, and Gould and Quinn is owed some money. Laura Gordon, Dwight and Kathy Doden. Uh, they, I think they live in Barnard. Woodstock Ambulance is owed money. I'd check into that, guys. Uh, Dunham Hill Bakery. Kerry Cole is owed money. Uh, Max Cummins, Paul Heiberg, Glenn Holmes, T Jody Anderson, Neil Lance, Jody Loring, Katie Merrill, Dan Noble, Dan Orkin. Chet Palmer, Butch Roy, Bruce Schultz, Adrian Tans, Alex Sudnakis. So if you know any of these people, tell them the state is holding some money for them. Okay, but the legislature has been very That's busy this great. year uh, on paid family medical leave insurance. Um, there was a, uh, a bill that was passed last year and they never made it across the finish line. Uh, it died in the conference committee, but it came back this year and the House and Senate came to an agreement uh, to provide paid family leave to employees to a wage replacement for when you're taking care of a newborn or somebody else who's ill in your family. Uh, that was vetoed by the governor. There was an effort by the legislature to override the veto uh, and that effort failed. Um, there was an increase in the minimum wage passed last year by both houses. Uh, it then also went to a conference committee um, and then it was taken up again in January of this year, passed both houses uh, sent to the governor, the governor vetoed that, and this past week, uh, for the tenth time in Vermont's history, the legislature overrided the governor's veto and established a new minimum wage, uh, raising it from $10.96 an hour to $11.75 in 2021 and to $12.55 in 2022. So that is an increase in the minimum wage that just passed. Retail sales of recreational marijuana. Uh, so the House just passed out this week a bill that will establish a regulatory system for the retail sales of recreational marijuana. So what we have right now is a very unregulated market uh, in which uh, individuals are able to grow pot on their own, grow, grow your own, uh, which was all well and good, except that we have now a totally unregulated market. Uh, and we have uh, an issue with uh, a very contaminated supply and we can't claim that the marijuana that people are using, and we know they are using it, is safe for consumption. Um, so this bill really tries to put, it was passed by the Senate last year, went over to the House, and went through every committee in the House to try to figure out how do we regulate this, how do we tax it, how do we make sure that people are safe, uh, both on the roads and uh, regarding mental health, how do we uh, make sure that people are not unfairly discriminated against uh, through this and establish a licensing system uh, so that there are six different types of licenses. It's different from the Senate position in that, um, in the tax structure, and also on whether a town can, has to opt in to have a retail establishment or opt out. The House is saying a, a town has to take a town-wide vote to opt in to have a retail establishment. The Senate's position has been to opt out, meaning that every town could have one if the select board grants a liquor license, or in this case, a marijuana license from the Cannabis Control Board uh, to have a retail establishment. Okay, so then we move on to Act 250 reform. Just passed the House yesterday. And this is an attempt to modernize Act 250. Some of the provisions that are in there are about climate change and making sure that we uh, anticipate um, developments and how they affect erosion uh, and different aspects of climate change to make sure they're taking into account for large storms and other events that are happening. It also uh, exempts trails, uh, recreational trails from Act 250 jurisdiction, or at least sets up a, pl uh, a process to get that done. It also exempts uh, village centers, downtown, uh, designated downtowns, and uh, neighborhood development areas. So Woodstock is a, is a village center. 
Uh, and it would then have the ability to exempt projects from Act 250 inside of the village of Woodstock, which I think is really cool. Um, the Global Warming Solutions Act was passed by the House, and this codifies a reduction in greenhouse gases by 80% by 2050 from 1990 levels, and establishes a plan to do it and holds the government accountable to getting it done. A goal is nice, this makes it part of the law. And there's many other things. We only have a four and a half billion dollar pension uh, deficit. Um, the the public, public Employees Retirement Fund is short four and a half billion dollars by estimates. The state is contributing 200 million dollars every year to pay down that liability. And uh, that by 2038, we should not have to pay as much. Um, it is a continuing problem and a drain on the states. So that's $200 million. If we look at every year, uh, also in terms of financing, the capital budget, which is spread over two years to maintain state-owned properties, is $123 million for every two-year period. So that's what the state is paying. So we do have a major issue in the state about educational facilities, and I know this gets into a different territory. $500 million right now is what the state is estimating for existing school projects. That's a lot of money, and the towns cannot really afford to pay it on their own. So how does the state participate? That conversation is going on in the legislature. There's no answer yet, and I hope that we can have one coming forward. So that is a, an update from, this, from the House. Remember, in the House and the Senate, we pass bills and pass them over to the Senate. That's going to be happen the week over after next. And they do the same thing to the House. So it has to go two different steps before it goes to the governor for the governor to sign. So that's an update from, from the House. And I pass it over to my esteemed colleague, Senator Clarkson. Good morning, uh, I'm Allison Clarkson and I have the honor of being one of your three state senators representing Windsor County and one town in Rutland and one town in Wyndham. And it is a joy to be here on town meeting day because we are partners, the state and the towns and the villages. We are partners in uh, improving life in Vermont, in maintaining the quality of life we share here and in taking care of each other. That's what we do at different levels. And uh, it is a wonderful moment at town meeting day to take stock of uh, our, what we treasure most, which is our direct democracy in our town meetings. And uh, your presence here today is a reminder that despite the fact that we have Australian ballot, we all want to discuss things and uh, we all care deeply about this town that we've invested our lives in. Uh, I would like to say that on that raw, raw note that uh, you may have noticed that the U.S. News and World Report has just listed Vermont as one of the, is the fifth best state in the country to live in. So despite the challenges we are working through together, despite the culverts on Gulf Avenue that are challenged, despite the paving, despite the schools, we are listed as one of the five best places in the world, in the United States to live, and of course the world. Um, and I would I'd just like to remind us of that perspective because it's one we lose sight of often when we're focusing on uh, the on, on the more on the smaller things that we're we're, we're looking at in our own communities. Um, we have we've done some some unusual things this year. I, I would say that in the Senate. So I serve you in the Senate. I serve uh, in the morning as Vice Chair of Senate Economic Development, Housing and general affairs, and then so Charlie and I work on complementary committees in that capacity. Uh, and in the afternoon, I serve on uh, Senate government operations. And in those capacities, we are really working, I would say, to incent all sorts of things. Uh, we're working on incentivizing more housing. We desperately need more housing in the state. So one of the exciting things that we are passing out of our committee is the Act 250, uh, sort of streamlining of the Act 250 uh, regulations and trying to rid ourselves of some of the duplicative aspects of Act 250, particularly in our downtown uh, areas. And we are uh, really focusing on increasing density in our downtowns 
and village centers and happily we are going to be in position to take advantage of that and I urge us to also look at the opportunity we have not taken advantage of which is building out our neighborhood designation areas which would allow us to take advantage of some of those uh, Act 250 relaxations uh, in a slightly larger area. Golf Avenue, for example, which we could do. Um, and we're also looking at incenting uh, filling jobs. We have about eight to 10,000 jobs in this state that are unfilled. We need to double the number of apprenticeships. We need to work on our job training and upskilling. We are uh, looking to bring people here to this wonderful state. We are aging, as you know, you're all clear on our demographic. It's a challenge and it's an opportunity. Uh, one of the things I'm most uh, excited about is our student debt bill because, uh, as you may know, student debt is one of the biggest barriers for rural states to attract young uh, people, both young professionals, and to bring people back home and to keep people here. So it, it is a, a challenge for everybody. Everybody thinks and knows they will earn more money in cities. And our challenge is to figure out a way that we can afford to incent and reduce that barrier for life here in Vermont. Because boy, do we have some great opportunities uh, for young people here in this state. Uh, so we're incenting housing, we're doing all sorts of housing work, economic development work, uh, and, uh, and student debt work and economic development. And in Senate government operations, uh, <coughs> David Green is right here. We're working hard on how to improve a very broken EMS system around the state. We're also looking to uh, create some pilots for regionalization of our public safety uh, <coughs> services. We have had challenges of declining student populations. We have declining volunteers for our most essential life-giving services. David knows this better. Butch knows is better, I and mean, we, we have a huge challenge facing this state. And uh, so we're looking at how we can fix that, particularly this year in EMS and some pilots in uh, law enforcement. We're also looking at creating uniform licensing so that, again, we can attract more people to come into our state to make it easier for people who hold licenses in other jurisdictions, nurses, uh, people in the military who are credentialed, and. Uh, who are terrific and we want to make it easier for them to come for us to review their license and say okay. Uh, we've just passed out a major criminal justice reform package out of the Senate which will go to the House uh, and we, you've heard from Charlie about all the other things. I would just like to say I heard uh, our wonderful Congressman Peter Welch last night at the Vermont Law School at a dinner uh, address something that I know is on your minds and it's certainly on my mind, uh, the coronavirus. And we, uh, while we have maintained uh, FEMA's readiness, we, uh, this administration sadly has not maintained uh, uh, the Center of Disease Control's readiness. They have let 1,600 scientists go from the CDC, and we are, un the, the federal government is unprepared for this virus. Our, our commissioner of, uh, of health has, is encouraging us all to really be careful, to wash your hands, you know, to be, extra vigilant, but we are, uh, we are not well prepared for this. And so I encourage us to listen closely uh, to our news outlets on how, we, how this is coming our way and uh, what we can do, each of us, to prevent its, uh, its spread. So thank you very much. I think just in, for issue, in terms of time, I think we'll probably take questions afterwards um, and unless you want to because I think you want to do something else now, right? Yeah, is that right? Anyway, thank you for the honor. I think both of us, thank you for the honor and privilege of representing you. We, I think we both love our work and uh, are stimulated and very moved by it. There's often it's very moving. So thank you very much. So Charlie, if I can just paraphrase Arlo Guthrie, yes, Officer Obi, I put that 88 million under that pile of garbage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, at this point, we would, um, we'll recess our meeting for lunch. Um, we'll reconvene at 1.10. I have taken note of who's here, so I expect to see you all back after lunch. <laughs> So we're in recess.
The church, the church does have lunch, as far as I know. Take that whole envelope, yes. and I'll put yes. this envelope on your desk in the back. Yeah. Um.